Hello, scholars. So, feeling a little better and getting back into things this week. Uh, here's your unnecessary Mr. A physiology update. Um, so, a little bit about me. I have one tonsil that's four times bigger than it's supposed to be, which means that the tonsil will catch more bacteria, and it predisposes me to strep a little bit, like streptococcus, that virus, a little bit more than most people is great so I get like once a year I'll get strep throat but every once in a while I get uh, strep ear basically where the strep virus goes up through the intraoral canal this is what happened this last week so I couldn't hear I had about like a strong ringing in my ear um, everything resonated really weirdly and then of course like it burns around the eyes too so it's difficult to see things and feeling a little better like this week there's like a little a little bit of a ringing going on I'm still kind of light sensitive but uh, enough that I'll be able to interact and get some stuff, uh, more stuff done this week. And we're getting close to the end of it. And we effectively have three weeks left in the semester. Um, from a technical standpoint, there's a fourth week tacked on there at the end. But classes officially stop on May 11th, I believe. And that's a Monday. And I'm not going to do a whole week's work for you in that one day. Uh, we'll just take that time to round up any projects that you need to get finished. And we'll talk more about those as we move forward, but like the last thing we're going to do is go back and revisit a couple of things so that we can uh, get them polished up and ready for you. So like the resume uh, cover letter, and this week we'll talk a little bit about interview questions, right? <clears throat> and that's great because uh, it kind of ties back into the cartoon discussion. I know, which again, sounds weird, but bear with me. I'll get there here in a couple of minutes. So I, I really enjoyed looking back through your, the discussion on the cartoons. It seems like everybody's enjoying that. And I'm sure you appreciated like a, another week. It's like lighter work, and I get that too. Uh, but there really is a point to that, as I, as I promised you last week. So when you look at what we pay attention to as children, it actually colors a lot of how we act as adults. And what I mean by that is, let's look at the most common things that we saw from this week's last discussion. So, uh, a lot of people talking about SpongeBob. Uh, not as many people talking uh, about Pokemon as I thought, based on some of your <laughs> discussions from earlier in the semester. Uh, uh, and even, you know, the discussion of Survivor Man, right? When we think about these shows and how you watch them as kids, because it's a little bit different now with streaming services, but... Uh, but how you watch them as kids, there's something very specific that happened when you were watching television as a child. And we all did this. It's not like we all lived in a cave under a rock. Like, we all sat down and did this. And every seven minutes during that television show, the cartoon or whatever show you were enthralled with, Wild Kratts, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, for me it was Transformers, because I'm a child of the 80s. But every seven minutes, a commercial came on. And that was a break for your brain. And what this means is this. We're sort of programmed by our childhood anagrams to pay attention for seven minutes at a time. And then we go away a little bit. It wasn't always like this. When we first started doing education back in ancient Greece, I'm talking about I Socrates, the guy before Socrates, um, and uh, Aristotle and Plato, and Socrates himself, for that matter, and then like, later Quintilian and Cicero and, and a number of other, you know, very fancy exotic names like that. The way they would teach, and Aristotle's a really good example of this, the way they would teach is the, is the students would gather around and they would sit in this large amphitheater that kind of been set up and they would listen to the master talk. Now they couldn't take notes. No computers, obviously. But they didn't have paper either. And again, those of them that knew how to write, and very few of them did, they wrote on vellum, which is sheepskin. It was really expensive. So very few students were actually taking notes. And in fact, a, a lot of these guys didn't even write anything down. Like when, when Aristotle died, uh, his students got together and wrote out all his lessons. Like that's the reason we still study Aristotle today. Not because Aristotle wrote stuff down, because his students wrote stuff, wrote stuff down for him. But I digress. So Aristotle would stand up in front, of the, in front of the class, 100 or so students, and he would speak for three hours. 
three hour long lecture. No questions, no interruptions, everybody sat and paid attention. And they broke out into small groups. It would be like a leader and then like a few other students, like an older student would be the leader. And one or two students would be selected and their task was to repeat the entire lecture. Right? <laughs> so uh, what probably shocks you is that they could do this. And the reason being is because that's how they were taught to pay attention and how they were taught to learn. And then as we move forward, the way we learn changes. So as paper became more available, I mean, people started learning a little bit more through uh, visual cues and reading. Uh, really, like when, when Gutenberg created the print pre printing press, like that was a huge step forward. Because then we could mass produce books on a scale never seen before. Uh, and later, the, the, the invention of the steam engine, which would, which would take books all over the country, all over the world, made it easier for people to learn. We created specific schools, just here in the United States, where people would go and study for six hours a day, uh, and listen to a lesson and do homework, listen to a lesson and do homework, listen to a lesson and do homework. Students started learning to pay attention in that way. Then, uh, early, uh, you know, 1904, 1905-ish, somewhere in there, where, like, radio serials started getting popular. And this is, you know, story time on the radio rather than talk radio. Uh, think of it as, honestly, think of it like, like the storytelling podcast you listen to. The storytelling of the radio became very popular. People would listen to things like Jack Armstrong, The All-American Boy, or The Shadow, which is, is the, you know, the early Cape Crusader, basically. And these were hour-long programs. People would gather around their radios, much like kids did, uh, at story time with Mr. Rogers in your age, or with, or gathered around for uh, SpongeBob, and they would listen for an hour, and then there'd be an advertisement and messages from sponsors, and then a different show would come on. And so our attention span shrunk during this time from three hours down to that hour. But kids would pay attention very carefully for an hour and be able to repeat things back. As we move forward, things change a little bit. The television was a very revolutionary device, not only in home entertainment, but in the way we learn. Television programs started off closer to that radio format, where there'd be like a 20-minute show or a half-hour show, but we quickly found out that advertisers could make a lot of money using the television. Selling things like dishwashers, a new car, that Encyclopedia Britannica set <laughs> that we no longer need to have on our shelves. Uh, and, and as they studied how to, how to most properly deliver these advertisements to you, they found out that people would, would tolerate it at intervals of seven minutes. Anything less than that, and folks got angry, they'd turn to different channels, they'd stop paying attention to the show. So advertisers invested heavily, television fought, fell in suit, for money-making purposes, and our attention span has dwindled down to the seven-minute window. Uh, personally, I think it's going back up right now, uh, and streaming services are really the way that it looks at this. And we kind of like, we kind of have these like, varying paths because there's some people that go onto YouTube and they watch, watch all those compilation videos, and you see this that rapid fire like every six seconds, like something changes. But for a lot of people, it's like. Disney Plus and Hulu and Netflix, and it's teaching people to pay attention for longer time spans again, which is great. So, like, education has had to follow suit all this time, too. Like, we used to teach that three hour time span, and we brought it down a little bit. And now, uh, your, your teachers that you really enjoy sitting in front of, like, they understand it, whether they realize it or not, they understand that, like, your attention span is kind of set at seven minutes. Not everybody, of course, but like, on average. And so just, it's almost innately built into them that every seven minutes they've got to change beats to help you stay involved. Movies do this too. Like watch through the Avengers. Like they try and reset yourself every few minutes to help you pay attention. And we can do it simple ways just by saying, hey, stop everybody, take a note, like uh, quick 
check your Twitter feed or whatever, like just whatever we can do to, to slow things down for a moment, give your mind a chance to reset, almost like it's watching a commercial. And this is important because a lot of you pretty soon are going to be going out and doing job interviews. Job interviews are these weird sort of impromptu question sets. <laughs> you know, things like, where do you see yourself in five years? Uh, in which you should not respond celebrating the five-year anniversary of answering this question. Uh, um, or, what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, things of that nature. Uh, but you need to understand that the people seated across the table from you have a certain finite amount of attention available to them. In interview questions, typically, like, you want shorter, shorter answers, right? If you talk for more than seven minutes, you're going to lose them. Most of them probably are going to be answered in like two to three minutes, maybe even less. Brevity is awesome. Off, awesome. <laughs> Brevity is awesome. Uh, but it's often one of your best friends when we're in job interviews. Because you want to give people enough to know who you are. But show them that you can be concise and speak to them on a way that they understand in a short amount of time. And that's what we're really looking for. Can you make yourself sound... <laughs> valuable, intelligent, and understanding of where your audience is. And I'll go back to what I've said a few times over the course of the semester, and I'll probably continue to say for the rest of my days. The audience is the most important part of any public speaking situation. Whether it's standing in front of a crowd of 10,000 people, whether it's in a class of 20, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one situation, like a job interview, a, a first date, a 15th date, a, a 10th anniversary, like my wife and I are about to celebrate here in uh, a month. That persons you're speaking to, or those people you're speaking to, are the most important part of the conversation. So we've got to understand what are their motivations, how long can they pay attention to us, what we can do to continue to, to evolve uh, and keep that attention. Right. So this week, we're going to look at interview questions. And, and I know some of you kind of already hit that job. Like, do you want, like, I know Brandon's really in that sales position he likes, sales position he likes, and, and Sean is, is working in a job they already loves. But let's play along, right? So I'll list a couple of questions that I would like you to write out and answer this week. And do this through assignment form instead of uh, through the discussion board, because we got the other discussion board going from the other, uh, the other video. And then... I will also task you with finding a couple of questions specific to your industry that you're interested in working in. And we'll do this very similar to what we're going to do with the resume and the cover letter. I'll get you guys some feedback here over the last couple weeks of the semester. And the last project of the semester will be to revamp those and resubmit them. So I really want you to have all this stuff just ready to go for you so you don't have to worry about it anymore. Uh, next week, I want to talk a little bit about thank you letters and gratitude. Uh, so like accepting acceptance awards or like sending out thank yous to people. Uh, but I don't want to get to it at myself in this week. So folks, thank you for the uh, continuing to monitor yourselves this last week. And as usual, if you want to talk about anything, please let me know. I'm here. Uh, I'm happy to sit down and chat with you at any time. I think most of you know that already. And uh, I look forward to seeing what you come up with this week like usual.